Hey folks, this is Riker, and the first Diablo 4 quarterly update blog post is now live. So let's dive right in and go through this together. Now this first section here is written by Diablo 4 game director Luis Bariga. The D4 dev team has been hard at work since BlizzCon, and we are all still incredibly energized by the response to our announcement and follow-up blog posts. We are stoked to deliver the first of our quarterly blog updates with you, and this one happens to be a double header. First, we have a word from our lead UI designer, Angela Del Priore with some super cool updates on post BlizzCon feedback, controller support on PC, and a deep dive into couch co-op. Our second update is by our senior encounter designer, Candace Thomas. She shares a first look at a new set of enemies, the Cannibal Tribes of the Dry Steps. We hope you enjoy both of these updates. We're looking forward to your thoughts and comments on them, and please also let us know the sorts of things you'd like to hear about next. Our goal for these updates is to cover a wide variety of subjects and, over the course of development, share something exciting for everyone. Now, as an aside, I'll mention here that the devs have certainly been listening to feedback, reacting. So definitely, folks, do continue to send in your feedback based on these blog posts. Take to Reddit, take to the forums, take to making YouTube videos. Now, let's dive into the first section here, UI design, controller support, and co-op. This part written by Angela Del Priore, lead UI designer. For anyone who isn't familiar with user interface design, our team is responsible for communicating game systems to the player and providing players with the inputs they need to engage with those systems. So while we are focused on helping the player achieve what they want to do, we also need to balance that goal against the vision for the game while maintaining the clarity of what our interface is trying to communicate. She goes on to discuss some feedback they got on the UI from the BlizzCon demo. We saw a lot of feedback around the inventory, either regarding its coloring, the style or size of the item icons, or overall aesthetic. To avoid interrupting gameplay with pockets of inventory management, we're not planning on bringing back different sized items. So I know some people were asking for a return to inventory Tetris. It sounds like they're not going to do that. That personally does not bother me. That's not something that I was hoping for. With item icons, we'd initially pursued a painterly style to stay in line with the overall art direction of the game, and we're finding that it doesn't come across as well when we're talking about small elements in the UI. We're now exploring another approach, more directly based off the 3D models, to give them natural texture and realism. I think this is going to be a big win for a lot of people. A lot of people wanted D4 to be a return to more realistic, gritty, textured looks. As a point of comparison, this is what the item icons looked like in the Diablo 4 BlizzCon demo. And then a look back at the current work in progress items. It's not a night and day difference, but it is a more textured and a little bit more realistic look. We've also toned down the brightness and saturation of the icon backgrounds, which you can clearly see, as well as added secondary visual cues for indicating rarity via the border decoration. It's a little faint here, but you can see normal item, here we have the rare with some extra border, and then the red legendary item with even more border. We've reorganized the layout of the inventory to what is hopefully a more balanced composition. And across the board, we're looking at the color spread and contrast levels of individual UI pieces. Doing a side-by-side -side here to compare on the right the old BlizzCon demo UI to the new one. I would definitely say this is an improvement. We hope to both hone in on our goal of a gritty, realistic UI while balancing ease of use. The next bit states that they will allow you to rebind left-click to force move, and in fact, will be able to assign any skill to any slot from the get-go. This next bit offers some interesting insight into UI design. We went through a lot of iteration on this piece of UI, with reference to the left corner action bar. The left corner configuration came about because we wanted to try clearing the central combat area and freeing up the bottom of the screen where the isometric camera already sees less. So what they mean by that is, in a widescreen monitor with this field of view, you can see further to the left and to the right than you can toward the bottom. So having a UI clutter up that area makes you able to see even less in this direction. Back to reading, however, based on usability test results, the team's feedback and the feedback we received from the demo, we're going to move the default position of the action bar back to the bottom center for PC players. And then this animation right here, this is eye tracking, really useful insight. The preferred position changes to the left corner when people play further away from the screen. This doesn't come as a surprise given the shift in viewing angle. 
illustrative diagram below not to scale, but it does mean that the center configuration isn't a majority winner on PC since we're supporting controller input. So while we will only stick to the corner configuration on consoles, we will offer both left and center positions as options on PC. So basically what they're saying here is that when you have the monitor very close to your face, as in the case of playing on PC, your eye having to go from the center of the screen where the action is to the bottom left corner, that's a lot of movement to have to go back and forth. Whereas if it's in the center of the screen, the center bottom, it's a lot less movement. But if you're further away from the screen, as is the case when you're playing on console typically, then the movement from center to corner isn't nearly as bad. Nonetheless, on PC, you will be given the choice, and I'm always very in favor of giving players choices. Now, this next section seems like it's going to be good news for those who like playing on controllers. As a mouse and keyboard kind of guy, I'm a little iffy about this, and I'll explain why. This is the first time a Diablo game is being developed simultaneously for both PC and consoles. First off, I must be mistaken, because I thought that Diablo 3 was being simultaneously developed for both PC and consoles, but I guess it was originally just being developed for PC, and then the console shift came in at some point. Regardless. But the decision to support controller input on PC is what caused the greater paradigm shift for us. We wanted to give players the ability to switch between the two options freely, so our UI needed to be unified enough that swapping hardware inputs on the fly wouldn't throw people completely off kilter. A unified UI means our layouts are more grid-based for ease of navigation, but it doesn't necessarily mean an identical interaction flow. And then they have the example with an animation on the left showing mouse input and on the right showing controller input. It is true that the console and PC interfaces for Diablo 3 are vastly different, this does seem far more unified and it makes more sense to swap between one and the other. We try to maintain this sort of approach of keeping established keyboard and mouse conventions while creating controller friendly shortcuts or alternate flows throughout the game. Controller support shouldn't be a limiter on how complex our game can be, it just means we have more paths that we need to consider. It's not a simple undertaking, but we're really striving for a native feel for both types of inputs. Alright, that reassures me a little bit here. And the reason I'm a bit trepidatious here is because Previous games in the past that I've played that were designed for both controller and mouse and keyboard tended to give the impression that to some degree you're being limited because a controller only has so many buttons, a PC has far more. So the whole game seems sort of designed with the fact in mind that we can only have access to X number of buttons on a controller. They are, however, addressing here that controller support shouldn't be a limiter on how complex our game can be. So. Hopefully that means everything is going to be fine. Couch Co-op UI. Basically what they're saying here is that when you play Couch Co-op on console in D3, if you bring up the inventory, it happens for both players. So you, one player basically pauses the game for both players. In D4, they're going to have it such that you can independently bring up on the left and right hand side of the screen your separate two-player inventory. All right, on to something that's looking awesome here. Monster Family and Design Highlight Cannibals. This is written by Candace Thomas, Senior Encounter Designer. Let's go ahead and watch this video, Cannibal Family Turnaround. All right. Now that's what I'm talking about. Though, man, so this fits perfectly within the aesthetic, within that dark, gritty feel of the Diablo universe. Man, I'm almost surprised why, why was this not even in the game previously? And why haven't we seen something like this in past Diablos? It fits so perfectly. If you had a chance to watch our world and lore panel during BlizzCon, you learned that monsters in D4 are classified into families. In our various panels, we cover different monster families such as the Fallen, who are returning to once again terrorize Sanctuary, and the Drowned, who are a brand new threat plaguing the shores of this world. Now we would like to give you a look into another new family, the Cannibals. Now what is a monster family and why does it matter? Before we dive into the specific mechanics of the Cannibal family, let's take a moment to talk about our design philosophy when it comes to monsters. In the Bestiary of D3, we classified monsters into broad categories like Demon, Unholy, Undead, Humanoid, or Wildlife. These monsters served as an anchor to the story by adding to the overall setting and tone, which made the whole game feel complete. In Diablo 4, the vast and seamless world we created necessitates a slightly different approach to world building and storytelling. It requires building Sanctuary as a living, breathing character, especially through its creatures. I really like that. I really like that philosophy, that the world is basically its own character. Since we have everything from serene ocean cliffsides to the gaping maw of hell itself, in case anyone had 
any lingering doubts, we will have hell in D4. What does that mean for the bestiary? Well, to fill those areas and make them feel real, we definitely needed to have more non-aggressive wildlife than in D3. But never fear, we still have plenty of monsters to fight. Every monster has been reimagined, but in a darker, more gritty art style. We have lovingly handcrafted every creature you'll encounter from the ground up. That includes demons, NPCs, act bosses, and even the skittering critters you can crush underfoot. Though we still pay tribute to some Hallmark gameplay, such as fallen shamans resurrecting other fallen, we have completely reimagined things in other places. To have these creatures feel more sophisticated and robust, we designed them in what we call monster families and archetypes. Each family has a different combat style and feel. For example, the Drowned family has five members in various archetypes. Bruiser, Range Combat, Melee Combat, Swarmer, and Dungeon Boss. And this right here, you're seeing the Drowned family. Each archetype plays a different role in combat. Swarmers striking groups, making AoE attacks feel satisfying. That's area of effect. Bruisers are larger monsters with high health values, which will make damage over time abilities feel good. Melee combat units act as shields by standing in the way of projectiles for their ranged counterparts. Interesting, I wonder if the AI will actually make that happen, that the melee will actually give cover to the ranged units. Situations like this provide the player with interesting positional dilemmas if they want to focus fire on ranged units. When adding all of this together, each encounter with the Drowned will be slightly different with regards to player positioning and choice of attack. These rich and varied combat experiences are the power of a monster family. So in principle, I love this idea. I'm just wondering if in practice, are we actually going to be caring about our positioning and differing our attacks based on monster type, or is it just going to come down to plowing through everything really fast? From what I recall of my experience with the D4 demo at BlizzCon, combat was slower paced than in D3, more methodical. But in general with action RPGs, it's once the game's been out for maybe a year or so, and we are now all at the end game, and there's been a bit of optimization and some maybe some power creep that we start zipping along super fast, killing enemies instantly. But in this case, the design intent is there. Now, who are the cannibals? Here's a cannibal family lineup. Let's get a zoom in of this. Ah, uh, yeah, look at these guys. They look like barbarians, but with a more sinister edge to them. Ooh, here's some flavor text. Corpses riddled with bite marks, splintered bones scraped clean of marrow, tongues sawed off and eyes gouged out of their skulls. These are the bloody fingerprints the cannibals leave behind, if they leave behind anything at all. No one is certain where they come from, but some legends claim they are a former tribe of barbarians. Ah, uh, ah, uh, they perfectly captured that, right? That was our theory going into this. Banished from Ariat years ago. Whether their cannibalism led to their exile or developed out of desperation afterward is unknown. The outcasts brought their endless hunger to the dry steppes, and from there spread to the far corners of the world to prey on lonesome caravans and unsuspecting villages. The few who survived encounters with these butchers share the same stories. They tell of the mad fire that burns in the eyes of all cannibals of how eating the flesh of their victims in battle only fuels their hunger for more. They whisper of the unlucky souls spared in the attacks, hauled off like livestock for the raiders to pick clean until their next hunt. And then they say no more. The silence speaks for them. Sometimes it is better to die than to live and remember. Man, this is why I love the lore of Diablo, right? These awesome lore tidbits, this world, this dark fantasy world. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I think D4 is absolutely 100% and above nailing the tone and feel and visuals and atmosphere of Diablo. All right, so how is the story of the cannibals conveyed through combat? Starting with weaponry. The cannibal family has four members. They each have their own unique weapon and a significantly different silhouette or stance to help differentiate them from one another. We're going to touch upon Silhouette here. This has been a core philosophy for Blizzard as a whole, possibly forever. I'm not sure how far back this dates, but you listen to different Blizzard teams and they always talk about how important strong silhouettes are to them. Visual clarity, the silhouette being very readable, the silhouette being able to convey 
roughly what to expect from this character. There are two standard melee combatants, one wielding a two-handed greatsword cleaver, which delivers a slow, sweeping frontal attack, and the other using a lightweight halberd, which allows them to leap at players from a great distance and crash down with a devastating attack. The bruiser uses a spiked club in each hand to deliver intense blows that will stun players if they aren't paying attention. By contrast, the dual axe-wielding swarmers can unleash a flurry of frontal attacks that will quickly kill if left unchecked. However, this is a less binary pass-fail than the bruiser's stun attack. If the players find themselves surrounded by flurrying swarmers, getting hit by the bruiser's dazing blow would remove all possibility of escape. It's combinations of attacks like these that make this family so deadly. Again, that's what's really interesting about monster families is the synergy that arises from these monsters acting together. Now, I don't know if this is going to require some specific strategic AI to make properly work, or if just having these monsters in the same area, they'll happen to work well together. But this is nonetheless a very interesting design approach, I feel, to enemies. Archetype. Earlier, we explained how different monster archetypes play different roles in an encounter. For example, players who want to efficiently kill ranged monsters will need to learn how to reposition their accompanying melee attackers so that a cleverly dropped area of effect ability will target both clusters of enemies. This makes for interesting on-the-fly decision-making, and skilled players will be able to spot the optimal positions for these attacks very quickly. So that's an ideal scenario, right? When you have a battlefield of enemies, and you feel yourself needing to prioritize which enemies to take down. For instance, if you know there's a squishy monster that can die very easily, but does a lot of damage to you, and you need to take that monster down, you want to do that as soon as possible. But then, there's some other enemies that are preventing you from doing that, so you have to make the right strategic decisions in order to get to a position where you can take out the heavy damage dealer. This is a degree of critical thinking that is often not present in most action RPG endgame, and again, I'm curious to see how this withstands to end game tier play. By design, the cannibal family has no ranged units. Instead, they spring at the player with supernatural swiftness. Some may close the gap by leaping over obstacles and would-be competitors, while others will swiftly and deftly maneuver through other monsters to get first blood. This provides a very different experience and gives the player less time to make thoughtful positioning decisions, thus making combat with these flesh eaters feel frenetic. That's it for today, thanks for staying a while and listening. So that was a really cool blog post. I'm sure a lot of people were hoping for some updates on itemization, but they presumably can't do that in every single blog post. That said, they did state at the start, if you want to hear about one thing in particular, let them know. The skill trees as well, I'm sure, is another thing that people wanted to learn more about. And one thing I'd like to point out here is that they've already made enormous UI improvements to the skill tree. I wasn't terribly impressed with the visual of the skill tree here. I'm loving this new background. That That's helping a lot. Of course, people have much bigger issues with the skill tree than the UI design. Specifically, a number of people feel that the these talent trees are too simplistic. And as we're comparing side by side, the old to the new, we can see that it seems to be entirely identical. But of course, development is ongoing. We don't know whether they are or are not working on updates to the talent tree system or for more updates on itemization. But if those are topics you'd like to hear about or if there are other topics you'd like to hear about in the next dev update, Definitely, folks, voice your opinions, leave your feedback. So overall here, I think we're seeing some great changes in the UI. It's cool to get a glimpse at some extra Monster Family development, and I look forward to the next D4 update. Thanks for watching. Special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you like what you see on this channel and want to support the creation of more content, you can consider pledging on YouTube or Patreon and unlocking behind-the-scenes content, monthly virtual hangouts, and more. If you enjoyed this video, please share it, check out these other videos, and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more Diablo content.